It's a true pleasure to introduce um, Robert Hevner to you today. And the reason that not Evan but me, um, uh, but I'm introducing Robert is because, as I will tell you, we actually go way back um, to, um, I think I've known Robert for about 20 years now. And um, so just to tell you about his background, so Robert is actually a SoCal native, so he um, came back to his roots by um, joining the faculty here at UC San Diego. He then, um, from California, went to get his education in the Midwest, um, went to the University of Michigan, and from there on to an MD-PhD program at the Medical College of Wisconsin. So even during that time, I think he discovered his passion for neuroscience because um, as a graduate student there, um, he already published very prolifically, prolifically in the area of neuroscience and then went on to Boston to Brigham Women's to do a pathology residency and from there to Stanford to train in neuropathology and specialize. And then that as was during that time when actually Roberts and my path intersected because he then um, went on to do his postdoctoral training and um, research with um, John Rubinstein at UC San Francisco. And it was during that time that, um, as most of you might know, I'm actually not a neuroscientist, but I kind of stumbled into neuroscience um, through my analysis of um, a mouse mutant that I had generated that actually had a neurological phenotype. So for that reason, I um, joined the Rubinstein lab for like a year and um, participated in the lab meetings. And I do remember from that time um, Robert giving lab meetings and always um, showing these in situ hybridizations of the cerebral cortex and trying to figure out how the layering um, works and looking at the transcription factor TBR1. So even um, during that, like he made some fundamental discoveries during that time about the role of um, TBR1 and other transcription factors in neuronal development. And he then um, really maintained that interest when he moved on to the University of Washington as an assistant professor, where then he um, rose to the ranks and um, became a full professor and has had ever since um, his, uh, he started his research, has had a prolific research program um, <clears throat> that was N is NIH funded, very well NIH funded, and he's really continued on this path to look into the roles of transcription factors in cortex development and then um, in his research in recent years has really looked into the implications of um, these transcription factors and developmental defects for um, neurological diseases such as autism, epilepsy, and others. So I really look forward to hearing um, a 20-year update on <laughs> Robert's research. And without further ado, um, look forward to your talk. <laughs> I'd like to uh, thank the Stem Cell Program for inviting me to speak today, and thank you, Micah, for that very nice introduction. Uh, the full 20-year update, I'm afraid there's not enough time. We have to get back and write our CIRM grant, but I, I will uh, hit some of the key points and, and talk about uh, the regulators we're working on. So my title for today is TBR1 and, and OT2. Uh, TBR1 is a gene that I was studying way back those 20 years ago as a postdoc when, when Dr. Sander was a neuroscientist. And uh, since then, we've identified some of the targets of TBR1, and I'm going to focus for most of my talk on a, a new molecule, quote unquote, new molecule called AUT2 for aut autism susceptibility 2. I have no disclosures to tell you about today. Before I get started talking about the research, I'd like to give a little plug for neuropathology at UCSD. My other role besides a Sanford Consortium scientist is director of neuropathology at UCSD, where we have a wonderful faculty that covers uh, patient care aspects of neuropathology, as well as education, and uh, I'd like to emphasize here, research. We have uh, experts in, in the pathology of disorders such as brain tumors, 
We have an extensive collection of tissue from brain tumors, most of which have been molecularly characterized since uh, in the modern era. We use SNP arrays and targeted next generation sequencing to characterize the mutations that give rise to these tumors. So very rich resources there. Uh, our group also is very involved in neurodegenerative diseases, where again we have a very well characterized uh, tissue repository from diseases like Alzheimer's and uh, other brain diseases. So if you've been thinking about doing some work in the uh, neurosciences and would like to study some of these human diseases, we have uh, personnel that are eager to, to work with you, have a lot of resources, including in the newest revision of the ADRC grant that was just sent in last week, there's now an IPSC core. So those of you who are interested in working on stem cells having to do with Alzheimer's, uh, you should know about that. So uh, I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about our research. It's been, uh, throughout my career basically, even since my PhD before I knew Micah, that I've been studying the cerebral cortex. I think for neuroscientists it's a, a very alluring area because of its links to our cognition and uh, our sensory and our motor functions and, and it's so uh, large and expanded in humans. I know some of you are not neuroscientists, so in the cortex, a couple of important things to know are that the cortex is divided, as you see in the, the area diagram on the left, into, into specific areas. And these were identified more than 100 years ago by a neuroanatomist named Brodman. And basically at the front of the brain, frontal lobe is, is on the left of the screen. We have areas involved in things like motor function and planning. And in the uh, posterior aspects of the brain, uh, sensory functions, uh, especially, for example, vision at the frontal pole. And one of the questions in cortex development is how do these different areas arise and take on their different functional and histological uh, patterns? The other thing to know about mature cortex is that it's divided into layers, somewhat arbitrarily into six layers. There have been other systems that can be distinguished on the basis of cell size and, and uh, uh, how far apart they are, how much neuropil there is, uh, et cetera. And it's variations on this six-layered pattern that give rise to the distinctions among cortical areas that can be seen at the histological level. So how does this division into areas and the different layers of the cortex arise? So I, I need to give you a little bit of background about uh, cerebral cortex development. I'm going to focus here on humans in this slide, but most of our research has been done in mice. The uh, cerebral cortex has, shall we say, humble origins uh, from the rostral end of the neural tube as a very simple neuroepithelium. And uh, by the time the fetus is a couple of months old, there's uh, cerebral vesicles uh, that, that continue to grow. And throughout the remainder of gestation from, from three to nine months, the cortex expands and uh, begins to show the folds, gyri, and sulci that are so characteristic of the adult cortex. And by the time of birth in humans uh, at a term gestation of 38 to 40 weeks, the cortex looks very much like a miniature version of the mature cortex. although and all the neurons of the, the cortex have essentially been born, uh, with the exception of the dentate gyrus. And from there, it's a matter of, of, of growth and rewiring and plasticity. Now, if you take a section through the cerebral cortex at any of these ages, you'll see that at the inside, and, and in fact, in all parts of the nervous system, there's a central uh, space that's filled with cerebrospinal fluid, in the cortex, it's the cerebral ventricles, the, the lateral ventricles that are at the center of this space. And so going from the ventricular space to the outside of the brain uh, is the cerebral wall. And this is essentially, as I mentioned before, a neuroepithelium. This is a scanning EM here of the very early neuroepithelium. You can see the orientation of the cells. This epithelial organization is a very important feature of how the brain grows and is maintained throughout uh, most of early development. Like other epithelia, the cortex has an apical and basal surface. The apical surface is towards the ventricle, the basal is towards the uh, pia and, and the outside of the brain. 
And as development goes on, the, this organization is maintained. So this is uh, on the far left is a uh, section through a developing monkey brain uh, stained by a method that reveals these radial fibers. These are remnants of the neuroepithelial cells. Uh, at this point, they're called radial glial cells because they have some pop, uh, properties of glia, which are the supportive cells of the brain. And this radial organization uh, that helps uh, uh, keep proliferation, which occurs at the ventric ventricular surface, in register with the growth of new neurons, which occurs at the outer surface below the pia of the developing brain. Since Mitosis and growth and, and integration into the wiring are uh, spatially separated. New neurons have to migrate from the interior surface to the outside. And this is a, uh, based on 3M uh, reconstructions of electron micrographs by Pascal Rakish uh, some decades ago, showing that the new neurons migrate along these radial glial fibers and go to the, uh, from, from where they're born near the ventricle to go settle in the cortical plate. And in its sort of uh, uh, most elaborate conception, this is called uh, the radial unit hypothesis and the protomap hypothesis. And the idea here, this is uh, uh, really based on purely morphological findings, is that in the ventricular zone are these uh, progenitor cells or radial units that give rise to neurons that migrate out and sequentially colonize columns of the cerebral cortex. And the, co the cortex, for its processing, processing architecture, has very clear columnar organization. So a column of cells is devoted to processing one unit of information, such as a part of the space in the visual field, for example. And as uh, neurogenesis proceeds, there's a, what's called an inside-out gradient. So the deeper layers are born before the more superficial layers. So the later born cells have to migrate past them. And you see in, in the monkey brain, that can be from embryonic day 40 to embryonic day 100, this period of neurogenesis when these cells are born and come to occupy their different places. So that's your, your one minute uh, introduction to cortical uh, development, sort of as it stood at about in about 1990. Uh, when, when I was uh, pretty new in the field and but the molecular revolution hadn't really hit yet. So what got me interested in, in the uh, brain development, and here's one of those many in situ that Dr. Sanders mentioned in her introduction. This, this is a very old one from 95, showing a very interesting gene that, that, that turned up. Now, back at this time, Drosophila biologists were identifying Hox genes and others with very limited uh, spatial expression in the developing embryo. And it was really remarkable to see the same thing true in mammalian uh, embryos and fetuses. So uh, this is a sagittal section of uh, an entire mouse brain, and the white in situ hybridization signal is specifically labeling the cerebral cortex of this developing mouse brain, embryonic day uh, 18.5. Virtually all of the rest of the brain is negative for this signal. Uh, the olfactory bulbs, which are essentially a form of modified cortex, are positive. So there's an extremely restricted expression of a transcription factor gene in the cortex. And we looked at this and said, this has to be worth studying. Let's, let's see what we can learn about this gene and, and what it does in the developing brain. And this, this would be equivalent of about uh, five months of, of human gestation at this point. Um, this is just another view. Uh, the Allen Institute, of course, has a huge library of in situ hybridizations. This is uh, one of their versions. But I love their 3D reconstruction, which you can see. This is the developing cortex of the mouse brain right here. And you see the very high signal with essentially no signal elsewhere. So how do we study this? Well, an uh, important tool that, that we got from a collaborator at the time was antibodies against TBR1. We were able to show that TBR1 is specifically expressed by neurons, uh, co-labeling with beta tubulin, and specific types of neurons, such as relin-positive cahal rhesus cells. And uh, what was striking was not only that TBR1 is expressed only in the cortex, but it's also limited to the neurons. It's not in any of those progenitor cells that give rise to these neurons. So it comes on 
right after a neuron is born and stays on uh, for a long time with gradual decline after development. TBR1, in contrast, is not expressed in any of the glial cells of the uh, cerebral cortex. Neither astrocytes is marked with GFAP or uh, oligodendrocytes is marked with uh, O4 antigen. In fact, uh, TBR1, with its specific expression in neurons, is an example of several other molecules that were studied uh, uh, and identified at the same time, and some of which continue to be identified. Uh, this is a beautiful image of cross-section through embryonic day 14 and a half mouse brain um, acquired by uh, my technician, lab manager, uh, Mr. Ray Daza, who's been with the lab uh, the entire time with Seattle and is now uh, here in uh, uh, UCSD. Ray's here today. and. Uh, for those of you who have a chance to meet him, uh, he's a fantastic technician and, and connection to our lab. So I hope you'll see uh, Ray around at the consortium. But what this beautifully shows is that, so TBR1 is the blue signal here. You see the very high expression at the outer surface where the neurons are of developing cortex. None here in the basal ganglia, uh, absent from the thalamus but also within the cortex, a couple of other molecules revealed in different colors. PAC6, uh, this is a progenitor cell marker. You see it's uh, expressed very close to the lateral ventricle where those uh, progenitors are dividing and making new neurons. TBR2 uh, was another molecule that I got interested in because of TBR1, as you might think from the names. They're very closely related transcription factors. and. Uh, uh, are both involved in the production of, of pyramidal neurons. I, I've studied TBR2 quite a bit. I won't say too much more about it, except that it identifies a special type of progenitor cell uh, in the cortex. And if we look at a little higher magnification of developing cortex, these are these three molecules, uh, plus another one called NeuroD, involved in neuronal differentiation generally. And you can see the zonal kind of layered expression pattern of these different transcription factors uh, consistent with sudden changes in, excuse me, uh, in gene expression as we go from the undifferentiated neural stem cell-like progenitors in the ventricular zone to the maturing neurons out at the subpeal surface. And in fact, through a variety of comparisons and studies, uh, by about 2006, we were able to uh, show that uh, each of these molecules was associated with a specific differentiation stage. PAC6 uh, in these uh, ventricular zone progenitors is actually a marker of radial glial cells. Those radial glial cells that serve as guides for the migration of new neurons also happen to be the neural stem cells of the developing brain, and they express PAC6. Those radial glial cells produce another type of progenitor, these intermediate progenitors, and those are the cells that express TBR2, another uh, T-box transcription factor from the image I just showed you a second ago. And as those uh, progen intermediate progenitors divide to produce new neurons, they go through co-expression of NeuroD and uh, eventually upregulation of TBR1. These Radial glial cells, as I mentioned, are essentially neural stem cells, while these intermediate progenitors that express TBR2 are committed to make neurons. So they're no longer multilineage. They're not stem cells in that sense. They also have very limited uh, proliferative potential. And let me show you some examples of what I mean by that. So one way to trace the progeny of these radial units, the uh, neural stem cells that produce the cortical neurons, is by lineage tracing uh, with genetic techniques, one of which is called MADAM. I'd like to show you our recent results from uh, looking at lineage tracing with MADAM. And without going too much into it, this is a genetic method that enables us to sparsely label a clone of cells from a dividing progenitor. So if we uh, activate a clone at embryonic day 11.5, early in cortical development, uh, using a, a, a driver that, that labels clones from radial glia, the neural stem cells, we get clones that look like this. 
Red and green are the two daughter cells of that one radial glial cell division. And we can compare the clonal output of those two sister cells now. And what you see is that they have very similar uh, organization here. The dots uh, just visualize things a little bit more clearly, spanning all of the cortical layers. So these stem cells produce all the layers in very much of a narrow columnar pattern. Really beautiful. Uh, from these early ages, they, they produce clones uh, typically in the size of dozens of new neurons by the time we look at them. Uh, in contrast, those intermediate progenitors, the ones that express TBR2, give rise to much smaller clones generally, typically just a pair of sister neurons derived from one division uh, that go to the layer that was being generated at the time that, that they were labeled. And uh, here's an example of cells like that. And this is uh, new information and, and uh, uh, is, is currently under review. Uh, Rarely, those intermediate progenitors produce somewhat larger clones. And uh, interestingly, for those of you who are interested in, in apoptosis in development, they seem to undergo a binary cell death uh, decision. So we only get single color labeled clones when intermediate progenitors produce these larger uh, progeny groups of neurons. Something about cell death is necessary to produce these other larger clones. Well, I'm going to turn back now to TBR1 and talk about its function. And of course, the natural way to study function uh, in most of our research, and, and it has been for a long time, is to make a knockout mouse. So what does the knockout mouse look like? Well, as a, a neuropathologist, I felt like I was applying my neuropathology skills to, to look at the mouse brain. Uh, but we have so much better, more sophisticated tools uh, for research than we can uh, in humans. So our understanding of many malformations is, is really much better in uh, the mouse models. And this is what the mouse model looks like. So a normal uh, neonatal cortex in the mouse brain has a, a nice laminar organization, sewn with a general cell stain like the Nissel uh, preparation. But we get a lot more insight by using molecular markers. Here we have uh, two-color immunohistochemistry for transcription factors CUX1 in red, which labels the upper layer neurons, and CTIP2, another transcription factor that labels uh, layer five neurons at this age. So you see the nice laminar pattern, uh, very, very even across. And in the TBR1 null cortex, these mice uh, tend to die in the postnatal period. Uh, so this, that's when we're studying. This is right after birth. Very disorganized layers, visible even on a standard uh, general cell stain. But again, the molecular markers give us even more insight as to how disorganized this cortex is. Some of the upper layer neurons uh, labeled in red make it to the upper layers, but a lot of them are trapped uh, down beneath the layer five. And layer five doesn't even look like a layer at all. It's just patches of cells that are kind of aggregated together. So, we would categorize this as a migration defect, uh, giving, up, uh, giving rise to abnormal uh, lamination of the TBR1 null cortex. The other major defect that we see in, in the TBR1 knockout mice is a loss of connections with other brain areas. So the way that we studied uh, these kind of connections uh, at this point was to use a tracer called DIE. It's a bright red fluorescence, and we just inject it into whatever brain area we want to study, and, and it can diffuse along axons to label the connection. So in a normal newborn mouse, we put a crystal of dye in the cortex, let it diffuse, and we see several connections. One in the same uh, plane of section is that axons leave the injection site and track down and cross the midline through the corpus callosum. Normally, there are very strong connections between the two hemispheres of the brain through this, this corpus callosum. Doing the same experiment in a TBR1 knockout mice, the axons leave the injection site, but they never quite make it to the midline and never cross the midline. This is in the homozygous knockouts now. And instead form what, in, by analogy to human neuropathology, where a genesis of the corpus callosum is, is a fairly common malformation, what's called a Probst bundle. And these are axons that are supposed to cross the midline, but never quite make it to their target and instead form a disorganized uh, uh, bundle of, 
of axons that have just failed to cross. Another major connection that's missing in our TBR1 knockout mice is with the thalamus. So from the same injection, going to a different plane of section, uh, we arrive at the thalamus, so we could follow these axons, in this case, going this direction from the uh, injection site. The axons pass through the internal capsule, and there are very strong anterograde and retrograde connections with thalamus, so bidirectional connections between cortex and thalamus. This is the strongest connection of the cortex is with the thalamus. It's uh, thalamus's gateway of all sensory information into cortex, so those very strong connections with retrogradely labeled neurons in the thalamus. And in our TBR1 knockout mice, again, those axons leave the cortical injection site, but they never quite make it to the thalamus. They just end in the internal capsule. And moreover, we never got any retrogradely labeled neurons in the thalamus, uh, which means that those thalamic axons, the neurons in the thalamus that are supposed to send their axons into cortex, those axons never made it quite into the cortex either. So there's uh, severe problems with uh, the connect. There's several other connections that are abnormal. So it's, it's a disorganized and disconnected cortex in TBR1 mutant mice. Uh, they have reduced lifespan, uh, abnormal behavior, um, and so on. We also detected, beginning several years ago, as long as 2001, changes in the uh, expression of certain genes in the TBR1 mutant cortex. TBR1 is a transcription factor. It's very likely to uh, have a strong effect on downstream target genes. And in its absence, we saw a loss of relin expression. Relin is an important uh, molecule in cortical development uh, and disorders such as uh, schizophrenia uh, that's expressed in the outermost layer of the developing cortex in a special type of neuron called Cajal-Rizia cells. And labeling from uh, relin was absent in the TBR1 knockout mice. Now, this was kind of a candidate gene approach. We had antibodies to relin. Uh, we had in situ probes. We, said we knew that TBR1 was co-localized with relin. And so we sort of took a lucky guess with, with this and a few others. But um, uh, it gave us a very limited view of what the, the transcriptional effects might be. Of course, we wanted to uh, uh, get a broader view of what is the entire suite of genes downstream of TBR1 that help it help TBR1 correctly direct those migrations and the formation of those axon connections. So uh, uh, early in the 2000s, uh, we did our first microarray experiment, uh, first of many that have been done in the lab, and we've now switched to RNA-seq. Uh, these are great experiments uh, uh, for people interested in transcription factors because we can, we can look at the entire transcriptome. And one of the uh, well, I should say TBR1 uh, regulates hundreds of downstream target genes. Um, at least dozens uh, are direct targets that also bind TBR1, as shown by ChIP-seq or ChIP-chip. And anyway, one of the interesting genes that came out of our microarray experiment was called AUTS2, A-U-T-S-2, which I had never heard of at the time. But uh, uh, Francesco Bedoni, the, the uh, postdoc who was working on this project, um, was very interested in autism and uh, Rett syndrome. And so when he saw that TBR1, uh, and by the way, I should mention, uh, even at this time in 20, 2011, uh, we had no idea of any human syndrome connected to TBR1. It had not been connected to, to any human disorder, which was a great source of disappointment for me. Uh, and, and especially at grant time when I couldn't say what important disease TBR1 uh, was involved in. So anyway, we saw this connection uh, to autism, apparently. There was a very significant downregulation of AUTS2 per microarray, uh, microarray. And when we confirmed it by in situ hybridization, we saw that AUTS2, like TBR1, is normally expressed in the developing cortical neurons, as you see this white signal in the normal brain. But in the TBR1 knockout, that signal was almost entirely absent, so marked uh, downregulation of this AUTS2 gene in the cortex. We saw the same thing uh, at a little later age in cortical development, and uh, Francesco did a different uh, microarray approach at this age 
we were very interested in looking at subdivision of uh, cortex into these different areas, which seems to be mediated by gradients of gene expression arising early in cortical development. So we did microarray comparisons of frontal cortex in a normal mouse, frontal cortex in our mutant, parietal cortex control in mutant, occipital cortex control in mutant. And again, OTS2, uh, we found was very significantly downregulated in our uh, TBR1 knockout on microarray in frontal cortex, not so in parietal and occipital. These quantitative data matched up perfectly with what we saw in, by in situ hybridization. Uh, here, this is a sagittal section of mouse brain in the, the normal at uh, newborn. And the OTS2 signal is located essentially in the front half of the cortex and absent from uh, the back half of the cortex. So it's in the, the frontal lobes and seems to be uh, like it would probably involve, be involved in subdivision of the cortex into different areas subserving different functions. And this frontal lobe expression of OTS2 in the mouse brain was again completely lost at this age in our TBR1 uh, knockout mice. Uh, Francesco, with a little help from uh, Brandon Nelson, another outstanding postdoc in the lab who, who uh, was very good with um, CHIP, chromatin IP, and uh, mapping transcription factor binding sites. Brandon was able to show that TBR1 is very highly enriched right at the promoter of the OTS2 gene uh, upstream of the transcriptional start site. So TBR1 binds the OTS2 promoter. It regulates the expression of the OTS2 gene. This defines OTS2 as a direct transcriptional target of TBR1. So this really uh, intrigued our, uh, was very intriguing for us and uh, um, helped us, for one thing, expand the, the overall view of cortical differentiation that, that we had been putting together. Um, I don't have time to go through all the chip seq and, and microarray and RNA seq experiments that were done, but we now know that this is truly a transcription factor cascade. In other words, from PAC6, which is expressed in the neural stem cells, those radial glial cells of the cortex, directly binds and activates neurogenin 2, which directly binds and activates TBR2, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to TBR1 directly activating OTS2, specifically in the frontal cortex. And uh, the system uh, also involves negative feedback so that you get this zonal pattern and essentially during differentiation waves of transcription factor expression, PAC6, TBR2, uh, and so on. The second intriguing thing was not just how OTS2 fit into our, our differentiation, but we were very interested in what type of molecule is OTS2 because almost nothing was known about this. So when we identified OTS2 as a target of TBR1, basically <laughs> hardly anything had been published about it. It had been reported as an autism susceptibility gene in humans uh, by genetic studies, and that's how it got its name. It was originally autism susceptibility candidate 2. It is a, a large gene, about 1.2 megabytes of, uh, or mega um, bases of DNA. And uh, the full-length protein is 1259 amino acids, about 140 kilodaltons. There are 19 exons. And intriguingly, no close homologs in the genome uh, and no recognizable domain structure that might have been borrowed from other molecules in the genome. So it really uh, appeared to be a complete mystery. Uh, this group in 2002 did a pretty... Uh, extensive bioinformatic analysis do, using all the tools available. So OTS2 appeared to us as this kind of mystery gene um, of, of unknown function that, that uh, seemed to be important in frontal cortex development. It was known to be highly expressed in the fetal human brain. And uh, with, with Francesco's encouragement, uh, we decided to devote more energy to studying OTS2 and see what we could learn about it. And so I'm really going to devote the rest of my talk today to uh, OTS2 and uh, um, mostly our unpublished data that's, that's uh, uh, just coming out now. More recently, I'll say a little bit about the, the OTS2 syndrome. Uh, OTS2 became very important as a human disease gene even before we understood what the gene does uh, through genetic studies in humans. And, while it was originally thought to be an autism gene, uh, 
only a minority of patients have autism spectrum disorders. The most consistent finding among OTS2 syndrome patients is intellectual disability uh, and developmental delay. So the cortex, of course, very important in cognition. This is exactly what you would expect for a, a, a cortical gene. Uh, most of the patients with the OTS2 syndrome uh, um, are de novo mutation patients. In other words, they did not inherit a mutation from their parents, but a new mutation arose during development. They have a variety of other features, uh, low birth weight, microcephaly, in other words, a small head, small brain, feeding difficulties, sound sensitivity, language delay, uh, kind of floppy baby, generalized hy hypotonia. Uh, so, uh, a minority of the OTS2 patients have epilepsy. So there's really a spectrum of defects in uh, patients with OTS2 mutations, autism, intellectual disability, epilepsy, and I, uh, this is uh, an example that many neurological disorders are on a spectrum. Autism itself is a spectrum of disorders, but it's really part of an even broader spectrum that includes intellectual disability, epilepsy, motor abnormalities uh, that can all arise from defects that occur in the cerebral cortex. So one of the first things we did to further study OTS2, uh, in my PhD, I, I made antibodies. Uh, so it's become a lifelong habit. We made antibodies against OTS2. And uh, uh, on the left, we have more in situ hybridizations. I never seem to get away from those. Uh, again, confirming that by the time of birth in a mouse, OTS2 is heavily biased towards frontal cortex, expressed in a couple brain areas like developing cerebellum and thalamus. And this frontal bias arises as early as embryonic day 16 in developing mouse cortex. So uh, it's really part of an intrinsic genetic program for subdividing the cortex. And the, the antibodies showed us that the OTS2 protein, uh, here labeled green but showing up mostly as yellow because of overlap with red, is uh, for the most part a nuclear protein. Uh, and expressed in neurons, uh, co-localizing with this marker, nu n. OTS2 has not been detected in uh, any of the glial cells. So again, similar to TBR1 in that respect. Uh, while we were localizing OTS2, uh, a couple other groups did catch on and, and start studying OTS2 functions. And uh, two papers came out in 2014, and those are still the most recent functional studies of OTS2 in mice and both made different knockout models. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about them before coming back to our story. So uh, one of these papers was uh, from the group of Danny Reinberg in New York. And they found, using ChIP-seq, that OTS2 is bound to DNA and specifically is bound to active genes, active chromatin. Not, it's not a, a sequence-specific DNA binding factor. Um, it doesn't seem to have any other clues other than it binds to active DNA. And curiously, they found that OTS2 in the genome is associated with a well-known repressive complex called polycomb repressive complex 1, an, an ancient uh, epigenetic mark-placing complex. And uh, their evidence suggested that OTS2 converted PRC1 from a repressor to an activator of gene expression. Uh, we have a different explanation for, for this finding, so let me introduce you to the other functional study that came out, and this was by a Japanese group published the same year. They found that OTS2 is expressed in the cytoplasm and specifically in the neurites of uh, growing neurons, and they propose that its main function is to uh, regulate RAS-GAP uh, uh, signaling, that regulates phosphorylation states of various proteins and cytoskeletal organization, and that OTS2 is important for uh, neurite growth, cell migration in the developing brain. Neurites are important for probing the environment and guiding the migration of new neurons. So what we saw from these two studies was very different functions, and not only that, but also localiz subcellular localizations of, of OTS2. Uh, but it gave us uh, some, some basis for comparison as we did our study. Now, an important 
feature of AUTS II that I haven't mentioned yet and became apparent only about 2014 from human studies as well as this, this second study here where, where uh, some additional uh, transcriptomic work was done is that AUTS II is actually expressed as two major isoforms. There's the full length isoform of about 140 kilodalton. There are a variety of predicted uh, proteins, but the one that's really detected and expressed is a C-terminal truncated isoform, sometimes called variant 2. So here's the, the full length isoform. There's uh, 19 exons, as I mentioned before. There's a second transcriptional start site, it turns out, in exon 9, and that transcription from that second site is what produces the C-terminal isoform. In the previous mouse research done uh, in these two studies, the uh, only upstream exons were floxed uh, to, to give the conditional knockout, and the C-terminal isoform of OTS2 was left intact. So what we decided to do was make a new mouse model that would remove not only the full length, but also the C-terminal isoform. And the C-terminal isoform uh, actually may be the more abundant isoform in developing brain. I'll show you some evidence of that. It's also functionally active, uh, as shown by in human patients, uh, mutations that disrupt the C-terminal isoform give a more severe phenotype. And also in studies in zebrafish, uh, knockdown, uh, uh, the C-terminal isoform is able to rescue defects of OTS2 knockdown. So the C-terminal isoform seems to be very important, and uh, we thought that it was worth revisiting OTS2 conditional knockout to uh, do that. One way that we could look at the uh, full length and C-terminal isoforms was using antibodies. So we made two antibodies, uh, one against the, the C-terminal end of the protein and one against the N-terminal end of the protein. The N-terminal end of OTS2 is not uh, expressed as part of the C-terminal isoform. So those antibodies detect only the full-length protein. And using the N-terminal antibody, looking at different stages of cortical development in the mouse here, we see very low expression of the N-terminal, in fact, not detectable in the earliest stages, and it only gradually comes out uh, about the time of birth it becomes higher expressed. In contrast, when we use our C-terminal antibodies, we see very high expression from the very earliest stages and maintained uh, throughout mouse development. The C-terminal antibody detects the C-terminal isoform and the full-length isoform, of course. And at the highest magnifications, we always detect OTS2 in the nucleus. Um, the highest levels of OTS2 are, are always localized in the nucleus. Uh, we occasionally detect OTS2 in the cytoplasm, but we've never been able to confidently uh, distinguish that from background, which is, is always a little bit of a factor. Another paper that came out that uh, a grad student in the lab latched onto uh, was that OTS2 uh, has homology, very distant homology. This is the, the closest related molecule, something called fibrosin-like one. It's, uh, came out, uh, fibrosin-like one has no known functions. Uh, it's another kind of mystery gene. But it was identified in a uh, screen for the RNA binding protein uh, proteome. And with the homology of OTS2 to FBRSL1, we hypothesized that OTS2 might also have some RNA binding properties. And uh, the rest of the work I'm going to show you now is uh, all new work done by Anthony, Anthony Costanza, a grad student in the lab, who's coming here as a, a postdoc for at least a year or two while he looks for another lab. Uh, he'll be here today, in fact. His plane didn't arrive uh, uh, in time for this talk, but you'll be seeing Anthony around, hopefully. Here's the, uh, the N-terminal and the C-terminal isoforms. And we did a new bioinformatic analysis. So basically, since 2002, when the first OTS2 paper had come out and that bioinformatic analysis is done, no, no updated analyses had been done. So uh, Anthony and I uh, went into the, the current tools, which have uh, proliferated and become much more sophisticated, uh, including ProDOM, UniGoPred, there's NCBI uh, domain prediction. And using all these tools actually gave very consistent results. First, uh, you see all these little green bars. Uh, 
OTS2 contains multiple nuclear localization sequences, reinforcing our idea that it probably acts mainly in the nucleus. Uh, that's true of the full length and also for the C-terminal has an NLS. The other is that we were able to identify using these tools five non-overlapping domains. One has been called the uh, quote-unquote OTS2 domain. Um, it's common to, F, to not only OTS2, but its distant relatives FBRSL and FBRSL1. Uh, all of them contain this, this OTS2 domain. And the OTS2 domain has been associated with uh, poly A RNA binding and uh, RNA binding generally. The other domains include a, a, a PAT1 domain, PAT1 homology domain, which again uh, has functions in nucleic acid binding, and several other, uh, uh, three other domains of sort of unknown function that, that uh, uh, bioinformatics suggests might be involved in, in transcription, nucleic acid binding, and so on. So it looks like both the C-terminal and the full-length forms of OTS2 could be very involved in nucleic acid binding, uh, RNA binding, RNA processing, as uh, Anthony uh, had hypothesized. To look further into this idea that OTS2 uh, may be involved in RNA processing, Anthony did a uh, co-immunoprecipitation with mass spec analysis of proteins associated with OTS2. So, we did this experiment from cortex in contrast to some other groups that have, have used uh, cultured uh, cell lines. And so, so we really hope to get the in vivo binding partners of OTS2. Um, and that appears to be what we got. So we got uh, the mass spec identified a lot of uh, proteins associated with OTS2, for example, some histones, some splicing factors, some RNA binding factors. Uh, some of them are listed here. This is the GO analysis that shows the top categories of proteins associated with OTS2. Again, the number one being poly A RNA binding. So in other words, OTS2, which may itself be an RNA binding protein, associates with other proteins that are also involved in RNA binding. And together, these uh, proteins that OTS2 interacts with form uh, functional groups that have been identified through, uh, through interactome studies. Uh, for, for example, uh, a group of histones here, a group of uh, RNA regulators and DNA regulators here. I'll point out one is called NaNo. I'll be coming back to that one soon. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, that's, that became, NaNo became one of our candidates uh, to validate our results. Uh, because what's known about non-O, it's, uh, for those of you who are interested in splicing factors, it's a DBHS family uh, uh, splicing factor that also interacts with DNA. It seems to act at the sort of interface between transcription and uh, primary transcript processing and stays involved with processing even after the transcript has, has left the DNA. So if we do co-IP experiments, for example, we uh, use anti non O to pull complexes out of brain. Again, all these experiments were done in cortex using uh, uh, in vivo um, materials. And then probe with, um, uh, sorry, pull down with OTS2, probe with non O. We see that those two are associated. Uh, pull down with uh, non O, probe with OTS2. We get the OTS2 uh, uh, protein associated. And even when we look at by immunohistochemistry, we see that nano and OTS2 are expressed in the same pattern in the cortical neurons that, are, uh, that have just been pr produced and are developing. So we feel very confident about the OTS2 nano interaction, and that helps give uh, confidence in our overall uh, pull down and mass spec experiment results. Now, how do you show that a, a protein binds RNA? Uh, well, uh, the easiest way now is to do something called RIP-seq, or RNA immunoprecipitation followed by sequencing. It's analogous to, say, CHIP-seq, and so uh, that's what Anthony did next. He took uh, uh, extracts from developing cortex, used antibodies against OTS2 to pull down the complex, and then analyzed 
uh, the RNA that was bound to that complex with appropriate controls. And the controls RNA was not pulled down. In with OTS2, we got an uh, extensive amount of RNA pulled down. Um, and the enriched genes on the pull down are marked on this uh, plot inside the red box here. Uh, these are the names of some of the genes that we pulled down. Uh, one, for example, is, is PREX1. I'll be coming back to that. That's a regulator of uh, intracellular signaling involved inside a skeletal organization. So this experiment suggested that OTS2, in fact, uh, either directly or as part of a complex, does interact with RNA and specific species of RNA. When we subjected that entire complement of RNA pulled down by OTS2 to, to uh, functional analysis uh, using bioinformatics, uh, in terms of the molecular function of, of the RNAs bound by OTS2, OTS2 binds RNAs that encode proteins involved in microtubule binding, uh, acetylated histone binding, and some of the other functions listed here. In terms of biological process of the RNAs bound by OTS2, uh, again, OTS2 regulates RNAs that are involved in RNA processing. So uh, RNA processing is extremely important in development. Uh, that's been shown in many systems, and it's certainly true in developing cortex, because you, you ha as you go through stages of differentiation, you have to sort of clean the slate of progenitor RNAs and express a whole new set of RNAs involved in neuronal differentiation, you need to stabilize those RNAs, splice them differently. So OTS2 seems to be part of that entire process of uh, regulating RNA in, in new neurons. So just to summarize what I've told you about OTS2 so far, and it interacts with other proteins involved in RNA processing, as well as with chromatin binding proteins. We believe that OTS2 complexes can be found on active DNA, as, as shown from ChIP-seq in, in, uh, by a previous group, uh, as well as with RNA. The OTS2 complex is rich for RNAs that encode previously identified OTS2 functions, so uh, regulation of gene expression uh, and regulation of, uh, of the cytoskeleton. And the next question for Anthony was, are RNAs bound by the complex dysregulated in the absence of OTS2? And to answer this question, we made a new mouse model of OTS2 deficiency uh, uh, in which we uh, removed. Here, here's the, our construct uh, down here with the arrows. Here's the, the exons of OTS2. We floxed exon 15 so that in the presence of the appropriate Cree driver, exon 15 is removed. This disrupts both the C-terminal and the full-length isoforms. And we confirmed that by immunohistochemistry, uh, normal OTS2 immunohistochemistry in developing cortex, uh, loss of OTS2 Im uh, immunoreactivity in the conditional knockout. And this is using the C-terminal antibodies that can detect both the C-terminal and the full-length isoforms. So we believe that both isoforms are disrupted. RNA-seq showed that the uh, uh, pattern of, of, so OTS2 levels were low, but by RNA-seq we could still analyze what's happening to OTS2 RNA. And if you look at the blue trace here, these are, uh, each vertical line is an axon, and these, these little arcs are introns. This is exon 15 here. In normal splicing, OTS2 is always spliced to include exon 15. In our conditional knockout mice, that's totally gone, and there's a aberrant splicing to the next exon, and that gives, up, gives rise to a nonsense uh, truncated frame shift uh, kind of mutation. So uh, to look at the RNA dysregulation in the OTS2 conditional knockout cortex, Anthony did comparative RNA sequencing. So we extracted all the RNA from cortex of control and OTS2 CKO cortex and compared them by RNA-seq. What emerged from that was proteins, or excuse me, RNAs that are upregulated in the OTS2 CKO and some that are downregulated. OTS2 itself, of course, is very much downregulated with very high uh, significance. PREX1, this regulator of the cytoskeleton and neurite outgrowth, was downregulated. Uh, we believe that regulation of RNAs can explain some of the results from previous functional studies. 
Uh, and then we saw upregulation of a variety of, of RNAs. So OT2 seems to have, uh, be able to both increase or decrease the amount of RNA expression. Uh, we, we recognized some of these as important neuronal differentiation genes and decided to focus on one of these, uh, PENC, for validation, uh, actually several, but I'm going to show you for, for PENC in a second. When we looked at the RNAs that are regulated by OTS2, this, these, again, uh, are genes that are dysregulated in the conditional knockout. Um, many of those genes were involved in uh, transcription, um, some proliferation and, and notch signaling. So uh, OTS2 regulates genes that are involved in the switch between proliferation and, and differentiation. We did in situ hybridization to confirm the, the upregulation of PENC. PENC encodes pre-pro and keflin. It's a, a neuropeptide gene that, that actually decreases neurite growth. And here's all the evidence that OTS2 is involved in an RNA binding complex. I, I mentioned the bioinformatic analysis showing the domains, the association with other proteins that are involved in RNA processing, the RNA binding to OTS2 complex, and the dysregulation of RNAs in conditional knockout mice. In terms of neurodevelopmental functions, I'm just going to show a couple of slides. In the previous functional studies, using knockouts that only got the full-length isoform of, of OTS2, no brain malformations were found. There was no aberrant migration, no, uh, no malformation at all. Well, in our knockout, Anthony identified atrophy or hypoplasia of the dentate gyrus as a consistent phenotype that was, that was very clear. We think there are others. This is the one we've studied most. Quantitatively, the dentate gyrus is reduced to uh, almost half its uh, normal size. The migration of progenitor cells into the dentate gyrus, the dentate gyrus is part of the hippocampus, which is part of cortex, but it develops by its own mechanisms that involve uh, migration of progenitor cells, which we can label with TBR2. And in a normal mouse, those progenitor cells migrate and fill uh, the areas surrounding the uh, differentiating dentate gyrus. In our OTS2 conditional knockouts, the number of those progenitor cells was greatly reduced. Uh, we're not quite sure why that is. Uh, OTS2 may be expressed in the progenitor cells in this particular brain area, or the neurons themselves may not form a good niche for the uh, migration of uh, progenitor cells. And those progenitor cell defects produce to adult, uh, continue to adulthood. These mice have reduced adult neurogenesis. And a very striking abnormality concerns what are called the hilar mossy neurons. This is the inner, innermost layer of the dentate gyrus. Uh, these neurons can be labeled with SATB2 uh, expression. They're labeled green here in the normal. You see they're almost completely absent by the time of birth in our OTS2 conditional knockouts and uh, that remains true into adulthood. Not only the cells themselves within the dentate gyrus, those green cells are gone, but these give rise to projections into the molecular layer that are calretinin positive red, and you can see those red axon projections are also uh, missing. Our OTS2 conditional mice also have functional defects, abnormal EEG, uh, kind of a, a pre-seizure-like condition. So uh, what I've shown you about the OTS2 mouse is that OTS2 functions as an RNA binding protein in, in, in complex with other proteins, and loss of OTS2 impairs hippocampal development uh, by, by um, processes we don't fully understand quite yet. I don't really have time to say much, but uh, finally, TBR1 has also been found to have a phenotype and again, it's de novo mutations in TBR1 that give rise to an intellectual disability, autism, and epilepsy overlap syndrome in, uh, uh, with mutations all different parts of the TBR1 uh, uh, gene. And uh, there are some facial dysmorphisms that I won't go into. And some of the TBR1 patients have a dysplastic cortex. Typically, uh, these kinds of patients uh, don't go on to form families, and that's why TBR1, also uh, OTS2 for the most part, uh, has not been found to have a familial uh, syndrome, but really 
are made both TBR1 and AUTS2 are significant contributors to developmental delay and autism through this de novo mutation uh, mechanism. And here's more about the spectrum of disorders in the TBR1 patients. This is unpublished. It's a collaboration with uh, uh, Bill Dobbins, geneticist at UW. And uh, this is my last slide. I'm going to just say uh, 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 my conclusions is that OTS2 is an RNA binding protein. It may bind RNA itself or through its partners that are uh, involved in regulating this huge switch with neuronal differentiation. And deficiency of OTS2 that includes both isoforms causes a dentate gyrus malformation. And OTS2 and TBR1 are part of a transcription factor cascade that we can identify going all the way back to the neural stem cells. In the future, uh, especially here at the consortium, we hope to study uh, the human uh, OTS2 and TBR1 molecules and their targets in greater detail uh, using stem cell methods. We have uh, patient cell lines and plan to grow those into organoids and uh, do other experiments using the, the human cells in culture. I'd like to finish by uh, acknowledging all the people who contributed to this work. Um, of course, especially uh, my lab. This is a photo from, from up in Seattle. You see the, uh, the space needle in the background there. Uh, you see the skies were also very gray and we were expecting rain at any moment. Uh, the, uh, a uh, beautiful image I showed you before made by Ray Daza. He's right under the uh, space needle here and sitting in the, the back corner of the room right there. And I mentioned Anthony a couple times. Uh, Anthony just got his PhD degree a week or two ago, so he's, he's now officially Anthony Costanza PhD, and he'll be up here uh, doing some postdoctoral work. My colleagues at UW, um, other collaborators outside our institution. And here at SCRM, I'd like to thank all of you who have uh, welcomed me to this new environment and have even started helping me. Uh, Jake and, and Jennifer, thanks for your help getting settled here. I've already gotten some help from uh, Carl Willard and Allison Motri uh, with, with some grant things and of course our funding sources. And thanks to all of you for uh, your uh, attendance and your attention. Thank you. Oh, yeah. OTS2 seems to be in the um, nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm. So it has these potential roles as a transcription factor as well as as a splicing factor. So I just mm -hmm. wondered whether is there, where do you predominantly see OTS2 and does it travel between cell compartments? So where is it mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. in the cell and is there maybe some activity dependent shuttling or anything that could reconcile these two different roles? Right, right. That's, that's a great point. Thanks, Micah. Um, when, we, when we do our, our most stringent immunohistochemistry and look by confocal, uh, we always see the highest concentrations of OTS2 in the nucleus. The cytoplasmic OTS2 seems to be more variable. Sometimes we're not fully able to convince ourselves that it's there, but uh, we have not explored in any extent at all the possible shuttling that could depend on conditions like, say, uh, the level of activity in a new neuron, its physiological activity, its electrical activity. Um, and we have not uh, explored the possibility that it shuttles. Uh, there are ways to do that by, by tagging it and, and watching it migrate between compartments. And those are great questions that we'd like to, to explore more in the future. Does overexpression of OTS2 um, in the TBR1 mutants rescue lamination defects? Uh, uh, right, so since TBR1 regulates OTS2, maybe we can rescue some of the defects in a TBR1 mutant by overexpressing OTS2. And that's an experiment that we haven't gotten to yet, um, in part because it's, it's a difficult one, because the over if we're looking at developing cortex, our easiest route to get overexpression is to inject either viruses or, or electroporate plasmids in the ventricle where they will enter the progenitor cells, which is not a normal OTS2 uh, location. So the better experimental design would be to use a promoter that is only expressed in the developing neurons, and we just haven't really had time to, to make that yet. Uh, I'd love to make 
the C-terminal OTS2 isoform uh, under the promoter of TBR1 and uh, express that and see, see what uh, is um, rescued in, in that situation. But still, we haven't got there, but thank you. Yes, Carl. So I may have missed it, but I think all the uh, knockout phenotype you talked about was conditional knockout of OTS2. Did you ever make a complete, or did anyone make a complete knockout, and do you see any non-neuronal phenotypes? Right. Uh, thanks. So the, the question is about, what about the uh, complete knockout that's, that's not conditional? Are there non-neuronal phenotypes? And I, I glossed over that for, for reasons of time, but yes. Uh, so when we do the complete knockout, uh, using the conditional to generate the complete knockout, there is a neonatal lethality phenotype. So the, the mice don't breathe well and they suffocate uh, within the first hours. We're not quite sure why that is. We think it has to do with uh, some of the brain stem functions of OTS2. Human patients with OTS2 mutations have a variety of defects, skeletal, heart, uh, as, as well as brain, and um, we have not looked at those. Basically, we skipped very quick. Once we decided that the complete knockout was not going to give us uh, postnatal survival, we went to the conditional knockout, and in this conditional knockout, we use a driver emx one cre that gives us only cortical loss of OTS2. That enabled us to look at things like the dentate gyrus, but uh, we have not been able to expand to those other body areas. If someone is interested in this molecule, uh, I'd love to collaborate to, to do something like that. Is OTS2 RNA, is OTS2 RNA expressed in adult? And is there, do you think there's any role for it in, in, in maintenance of the neuron? Or is what you're seeing from the immunochemistry is simply its longevity? Right, so, so the question is uh, uh, having to do with the adult expression of OTS2, and we do see it expressed in adults. One neuron type that uh, expresses OTS2 highly in adult mice is the cerebellar Purkinje cell. Uh, we, uh, uh, there's a few other areas like the olfactory bulb in the cortex, and uh, the dentate gyrus continues to express OTS2 at fairly high levels. These are all uh, areas and neuron types that have pretty large processes and a lot of plasticity, um, but we have not tried to dissect the adult functions of OTS2 uh, from its developmental functions. It's, it, given its high expression, I would expect that it probably does continue to serve some adult functions, but we just haven't identified those yet. Also, and, is it developmentally relevant in, in the glial cells? OTS2, uh, we have looked in vivo and co-localized with glial markers. There doesn't seem to be any expression of OTS2 in glial cells. And we have not looked extensively at, at for any glial phenotypes yet. If, there, if we did find any, they would probably be secondary to the uh, neuronal phenotypes. So both TBR1 and OTS2 are fairly clean in the sense that they're limited to neurons and not only to neurons, but to a special type of neurons, which are the excitatory pyramidal cells. They're not expressed in the inhibitory uh, neurons. Yeah. Martin. So you showed the um, RNA-seq studies of the OTS knockout that had RNA levels that went up and down. Is any, if you looked at all at RNA processing, either changes in splicing patterns and changes in three, um, three prime UTR um, polyadenylation sites or any other sort of RNA processing? That's a, that's a great question, and it's a level of detail in our experiments, uh, in our analysis, because once you have all this RNA-seq data, it's really um, a huge amount of uh, uh, analysis that goes into to figuring it all out. <clears throat> and that's something we, we, we need to look at yet. So the easiest thing to get out of it is the levels of expression, and that's pretty much where we are, I suspect. Anthony, who uh, I would ask if he were here now, has probably started diving into that because uh, if, uh, I mean, there's a few possibilities. One is that OTS2 uh, mainly um, affects the turnover rate of uh, RNAs it's bound with. So it could just be levels. But no, we would have to look specifically for uh, splice isoforms. And uh, I, it, if Anthony has done it, I, I don't know what to tell you yet. But that's a great possibility.
Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you so much for your questions.